Big Podcast. It's Build a Big Podcast, a marketing podcast for podcasters. I'm David Hooper, and building audiences is what I do. I've done this for the last 25 years. A lot of people know me from my work with musicians, but I've worked with all sorts of entertainers, authors, speakers, comics, also podcasters. That's why I'm here to help you grow your podcast, build a bigger audience, make people care about what you are doing. Bigpodcast.com is the site. I'm turning 50 this week, and I've been thinking a lot about growing older, what I've learned in 30 years behind the mic, 25 years of working to build audiences, what has changed concerning both that and also other things. Earlier this month, there was a big blow up at Podcast Movement. If you're interested in that, go back a few episodes. It's not something I'm going to go too deeply in right now, other than to say something I noticed about it in that it primarily divided people into a couple of different ways. One, conservative versus liberal. You got the old guard, this is the way that it's always been. And you got the new people, mm, maybe it's not the way that it's always been, but there's a different way and we need to look at that way. And the other is old versus young. I posted something about this on my Facebook page. More or less, it was just to say, hey, this thing's making national news. This was before it had really blown up. I may be mistaken, but it had 150 something comments on it. And every single one of them was from an older white guy. And by old, I mean somebody, you know, around my age, definitely some people that were older than me. Old versus young, that's how it divided people. The world is changing. And even at 50, I've seen a lot of this. The world that I grew up in does not exist anymore. So you can imagine what it's like for somebody who's even older than I am. I try to have empathy with somebody who's 60, 70 years old. By God, this is the way that it is. Okay, maybe it was that way, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe we have limited info. I try to be open as well. I try to have empathy for somebody who's more conservative than I am. Maybe somebody didn't grow up in the city like I did. They weren't exposed to as many different types of people that I was. Anyway, I've been listening to a podcast. It's called 1% Better. The host, Joe Ferrero, that's the guy I'm interviewing on this episode, It's about what the title says. It's about getting better in small increments. The Japanese call it Kaizen. Nissan or Nissan, as everybody else says. (laughs) Honda, these amazing engine companies, automobile companies that come from Japan, they are built on this philosophy. And Joe's podcast, 1% Better, it is about what the title says. It is about that, Kaizen, getting better in small increments. That I can relate to. My background in music taught me that. One day, I'm a guy that didn't play guitar. The next day, I'm a guy who didn't really play guitar. (laughs) And day after day after day after day after day after day of that, five, 10 years later, played a little guitar. That is how you get good at something. That is what I've found. If you want to lose weight, you don't take it all off at once. You didn't gain it all at once. Small little increments got you there. Small little increments get you back to where you were. And to take it back to turning 50, This is the question. How can you keep getting better as you age? Because things change. You get stuck in your ways. You're like those guys, this is the way that it's always been by God. Things change, man. The world you grew up in, even if you're 30, is not the world that we live in today. And something that I've thought about as I'm going into this new decade, how can I maintain my flexibility so I don't turn into one of these stereotypical old guys who hates everything and is angry all the time? Joe's concept he calls reverse mentorship. I'd never heard that. When I listened to his podcast, I thought, hmm, okay, that's interesting. It's something I've been doing, not on an organized level, not necessarily seeking it out. That's where Joe comes in. He was seeking it out, reverse mentorship. I brought him in to talk about that concept. I think it's important for podcasters. We do go into that concept. That's where we're going to start. But he's also a great interview. That's something I noticed right away when I started listening to 1% Better. So this guy's a great interview. He's listening. He's thoughtful about his questions. He thinks things through. So we spend a lot of time on how to do better interviews. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. It's a good conversation. He's very intentional about how he does things, interviews, what he's doing to try to become better. How does he maintain his flexibility as he's aging? Speaking of interviews, if you're interviewing people on your podcast, speaking of flexibility, a true podcaster can come in and handle a great interview. So how do you do that? One of the things that you want to do is you want to make it easy on your guests. You want to make your guests sound great. That's why this podcast episode is brought to you by Riverside. It's the leading platform to record studio quality remote podcast interviews and also video. Joe and I talk about that. 
the pros and cons of video, why you should do video, why you shouldn't do video. Regardless of what you do, Riverside can handle you. It is used by over 70,000 people and companies. People like Gary V, he does his podcast with it. Guy Raz, he does his podcast with it. Spotify uses it. The New York Times uses it. A lot of people using Riverside. It records everybody locally. It's easy. Give your guest a link. Give your co-host a link if you've got a co-hosted podcast. They click on it, boom. You're in the session. You're recording it locally. Everything goes to the cloud. Riverside stitches it together. Sounds like you're in the same room in a pro studio. It is that good. It's very impressive. You can try it for free. Riverside.fm. Check it out for free. You can do an interview with it. Two interviews, maybe. If it works for you, I've got a coupon to save you some money. Big podcast. One word. B-I-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Get 15% off. Riverside.fm. The coupon. B-I-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Let's get to it. My conversation with Joe Ferrero from 1% Better. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about a couple of things. I've been listening to the podcast and... This is something that I face all the time. I'm turning 50 this year. As I have crept toward 50, I find it harder and harder to fight off curmudgeonness. I feel like I'm going to be one of those angry get off my lawn guys pretty soon. I'm already starting to wear socks and sandals at the same time. One of the podcasts that you had, I thought was interesting. You talked about reverse mentorship. I thought that would be a cool place to start this off. I think that it is something that as we get older, we get used to our way of doing things like this podcast, for example, I do things a certain way. You do things a certain way on your podcast, but we lose that brain elasticity maybe, and we don't have to. So let's talk about reverse mentorship. I love this concept. I had not actually heard about it until listening to your podcast. Explain what that is. It was one of those things where did I invent this? Is this something that existed before I thought about it and put it on a podcast? Uh, it turns out that some of the high executives in business have piloted this idea years ago, and they would use it for people who were really good at their job, but didn't quite know what this internet thing is all about. And they would bring in the young hot shots that were really green, but knew technology and knew the latest tools, and they would reverse mentor them. So when you actually said curmudgeon earlier, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'm doing an essay with my students when I'm not podcasting, and the author calls himself a curmudgeon because he hates tourism. So we can kind of put our line in the sand and say, well, if you hate tourism, I get it, the lines, the traffic, you know, ruining the uh, local area. But I've never found that to be true in my learning. Years ago, I kind of tried to refine my personal philosophy. And what I've boiled it down to so far is that I can learn something from anyone or anything at any time. Right. And I think that's experiences. I think that's people. And if I'm going to live to that philosophy, I think we have kind of two prongs, right? We can accidentally learn from people, things that I'm going to learn today. There's no question. But I think that this day, today, in our, our chance meeting, falls into that bucket of the intentional seeking. Who do we seek out to learn from? You know, I can learn from your professionalism on the microphone. But to get to the reverse mentoring piece, what I've found is that I've, I often seek out people who are younger than me, both formally and informally. So I think at its essence, reverse mentor is, is learning from someone who has less experience than you and doing it on purpose. I've heard people talk about mentorship saying that their mentors are books or their mentor doesn't know they're a mentor. How does it work for reverse mentorship? That's a beautiful question and reminds me of the scene in Goodwill Hunting where Robin Williams is interviewing Matt Damon and he says, who are your friends or your mentors? And he starts quoting Nietzsche and Flannery O'Connor and Michelangelo and all these authors that have been dead. And he said, you know, Robin Williams even makes a comment about it, says, you know, you're not going to bring, you're not going to have too many conversations with them. Right. He says, yeah, that doesn't mean they're not, not my mentors. And they go back and forth a bit on that. But from my vantage point, being on this microphone with you, I just find that conversation is my most efficient and most exponential way to learn because we can bounce ideas off of each other. So can I read a book? I can and I will, but I won't get as much out of it as a conversation with you. And I won't get as much out of it as a conversation with my reverse mentor, any mentor, of course. But the idea of reverse mentoring, um, I have a couple of parameters that I try to put up around that that, that help it be more effective. But I, I believe um, it helps quite a bit to have those conversations. Now, you got me thinking, can I look up to someone who is much younger than me in the public eye doing something I admire? Absolutely. But I think if I'm really defining the mentorship, I like that ability to bounce ideas off him or her. And I think that that's something invaluable. Two things. One, there's the interactivity, because I, I do think sometimes 
probably all the time, there needs to be clarification because how we see something from the outside is different from how it is on the inside. We can ask a mentor, ask anybody, you and me here, I can say, well, give me clarification on that, which is what I'm doing now. The thing I like though about this, having a a mentor out of a book or somebody like Nietzsche, we can try to maybe be like we think these people are. And being in the entertainment industry, I can tell you that your heroes, if you want to call them that, they're just regular people. We just see them on stage and we see the highlight reel, much like we might see on Instagram today. But they're just regular people. Sometimes it can destroy somebody to have a hero and then find out they're really maybe not as together as they are. But I do like the concept of trying to go for maybe an archetype of what we think those people are. And also love the concept of what you're talking about, because that's really like the nitty gritty. That's where I think the real work is done, though, and uh, maybe a lot tougher to actually find out that, you know, stuff is a little more complicated or messy than we realize. And it's going to take us a little bit more to attain that. Like maybe these younger people that you're learning from, talk about that. Like, what are you learning? I don't know how old you are. You're closer to my age than maybe a millennial. 44. You didn't come out of the womb with the Samsung Q2U and knowing how to use it. (laughs) Talk about the kind of stuff that you're learning from from younger people. That's a very good point there, right? It's the technology piece is so easy for low-hanging fruit to say, if you're not using X, Y, and Z technology, you know, maybe you're not up on the latest things. And it could be just like what they call a thin slice in um, psychology where you're just like, I heard one time, I think it was Adam Grant that wrote this. He said, if you check, and this may expose some people listening, so I say this with love, if you check what your default browser is on your computer, whatever, <laughs> you know, throw out <laughs> throw out your, your branding here, whatever you want. But like at the time when I read it, it was if you didn't have Google Chrome, you were more likely to be blah, blah, blah. And the blah, blah, blah was something yeah. like stuck in the mud curmudgeonly. Yeah, or, you're you're or in the I default find. settings. <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. So look, when you say that, you immediately alienate everyone listening who says, well, well screw you. I, don't, I, I can't think that way. I don't mean it that way. But I do think that adaptability and, and an eagerness to look at the world wide-eyed, childlike, you know, the old anecdote, especially in the world of education, you go into a kindergarten class today and you say, how many people here are artists? Kids are knocking each other down to make sure their hand goes up higher. Oh my God, I'm an artist and I drew this TP and this is the most beautiful lake and I'm an artist. And you go into a 12th grade classroom and you ask the same question and you get one boy and one girl in the back, half hand raised, afraid to admit that they're an artist. And I think, you know, it's that Picasso quote. It's like, everyone is born an artist. The trouble is remaining that as we get to be adults. I think that has a lot of bearing on on how I see uh, the reverse mentor, finding the new tool, whether it's the Samson or whether it's just a, a great thing like clean feed, right? I mean, I, I like that. So those are some of the ways that I look at it. I do have a hole in my learning, which is I don't read a lot of biographies. I gravitate towards books where the author is sharing his or her ideas more than their life story. Right. That's something I got to think about at some point. But Well, biographies can be revisionist though. That's another thing to think about too. That goes back to what I was saying that Sometimes we look back on our lives and put a nice sheen on it that, you know, if we were living it. It's actually not quite that way. So uh, I don't know that you're missing anything, but I like biographies too. So autobiographies. One of the things that I've often said about growing up in Nashville, and I spent years and years in the music industry, arguably still in the music industry through the broadcasting work that I do, is that the best thing that can happen to you about being in Nashville is that you see that people make a living with their ideas. And you see people songwrite, or you see that it's possible. And I think that's half the battle. I think mentorship can do that. It's weird to me when I moved out of Nashville, and I did that for several years, that every city wasn't like that. I just assumed that it was that way, and people knew that. It is not that way. And I think that that's a thing that mentorship can afford you too, that even if it's looking at somebody maybe that you don't know, but especially talking to somebody that you do, that you see, yep, it is possible. And it's possible for you, not just me. I love that. And I think the philosophy that I outlined earlier about learning something from anyone or anything at any time, Nashville is a city. You can learn from a place. I can boil it down and learn from uh, how a restaurant is, is, is conducted, but, but a city for sure. And one, I have to plead guilty. I've never been to Nashville, which is another uh, hole I'm exposing here on the air. But I can imagine what you're saying is really powerful, Right. It's that cliche of the hope and the dream, but then the amount of hard work that goes with it. You can't imagine how many mentors people come across, right? And 
if I'm following a young person following his or her dream in Nashville, or if I'm a teacher and I say to my students, follow your dreams, and I'm not following my dreams. I mean, before we went on air, I had a student say, why do you have the microphone set up there? Are you recording a podcast? I said, well, actually, I'm a guest on a podcast. You're that famous, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Little as she know. <laughs> I, I mean, I paused for a second. I, like, I laughed, and I said to myself, all right, what do I say to this young lady? I go, you know what? I'm that famous that someone asked me to spend my time and share something that I've learned with a really good podcaster. So yes, that's that's the level of fame I'm at right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's like tickled by that. And she's like, go you. And I'm just like, well, it's a joy. It's a privilege. I yeah. don't take it lightly. Yeah, yeah. It is cool. I think that's one of the things that we have that you and I did not see in younger days. When I started in radio, we were, one, we'd have a, an antenna and we had to have a license from the FCC and you had to have magnetic tape and razor blades and a grease marker. You know, it's so much easier these days and these kids don't understand it. But I think that also is uh, an opportunity for us to mentor them. You're showing them like, hey, man, don't take this for granted. It's also a reminder for us not to take it for granted because it's certainly easy. We've had this technology for a few years. And, you know, I, I think that's the thing. It's like I took it for granted that everybody in Nashville made a living with their creations. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And that's another reason to reach outside the box. I think that's one of the things that podcasting can do. We don't have that geographic media that we used to have. Even cable television, so different. I, I used to, when I was in Nashville growing up, you could tell people from outside the city by different accents or different things that they like. And I knew things were starting to happen when MTV came on and even the girls from the county were dressing like the girls from the city. I was like, oh, something's up here. And, you know, again, that goes maybe back to mentorship too. It's like you find different places to learn. I think it's just being open to that. Yeah. And I, I love the idea. I think it's harder to take it back to what I said at the very beginning that as we get older, you like, you think you know how it is and the world has changed and, and you don't maybe. Yeah. You touch on an interesting thought there, which is like the young people um, don't have as many excuses anymore. Right. So it's like if they see a 44 year old father of two teacher, podcaster, coach, consultant, also doing the podcast with a plug-in microphone, you run out of excuses pretty quickly. So it's kind of like that challenge of like, okay, well, if he can do it, why don't I have time to do it? And believe me, young people have all kinds of challenges and things that we didn't have to deal with. But I like that idea. I'd like to play with that idea a little bit more and see in a non-guilty way, if we could just have a conversation with a young person and say like, well, what's stopping you? And a lot of times, David, it's that fear of uh, failure, or looking silly, um, they live on Instagram, as you mentioned earlier. So like, if you don't look as good for your friends or you don't get as many likes or it's that other type of pressure. So I think there's something to learn there going both ways for sure. Did you feel that pressure when you started the podcast? I was lucky enough to get what I will call a trial run with a partner. He um, He's a baseball coach and he was launching a, a, a coaching service for professional baseball hitters. And he said, I'm hearing this thing about a podcast that could be big and I have no idea how to do it. Are you interested? And in my mind, I was doing a podcast when I was nine years old and I would take my fist and put it in someone's face after a wiffle ball game and say, <laughs> Aunt Mary Jo, you just got the game winning hit. How do you feel? How do you feel? Take us to the moment. And then, you know, there's no recording then. So then the first recording for me was my brother had, a, or maybe my sister had a toy penguin that had a voice box inside. Yeah. <laughs> and you press the button and you get like 13 seconds of recording. And then we went up the ladder to a, the primitive recordings. And then I went to high school and I was broadcasting the basketball games, but not officially in any way, literally like a, a card table and whatever primitive recording device. And then they go to the college radio station, you know? So I felt like I had a degree of comfort behind the mic for a long time. But I will tell you that before I launched my own podcast, after the baseball podcast, it was almost a $7 fee a month for the hosting platform that cost me the whole thing because I said, I'm ready to launch. I got the idea. I got the logo. A couple guests that said yes. Wait, I got to pay seven dollars a month. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm out. I'm, I'm out. This is out. And he's yeah. like, Are you kidding me? Like, he, my mentor at the time, Kevin. He's like, I'm walking away from you. You pay. You pay seven dollars a day sometimes for coffee. You're not going to do seven dollars a month to launch your podcast. And here I am, hundreds of episodes later, and really one of the best decisions I ever made. So. There's a lesson in there about little things getting in our way too sometimes. Yeah, yeah. They can definitely provide the uh, ejection seat if we need them to, if we let them to. But it's interesting you're talking about, we're talking about you know youth versus more seasoned people. And 
that's the commonality. That's why I think these conversations that you're having, mentorship, if you will, reverse mentorship are important. You see that people are the same and somebody who's worried about putting something on Instagram, it's not that much different. We can transpose it to somebody who's 40s doing a podcast for the first time or simply speaking their truth. I mean, I remember in high school standing up and being like shaking when I wanted to say something, but I still did it. Yeah. You know, some people would not. And some people have the experience where they wouldn't do it again because it, it, it is so uncomfortable. But I think there's two things there that you, you bring to mind where it comes to taking the next level with mentorship, though. As I prepared for our conversation, I thought about it like this. I like to organize and formalize my mentorship experiences. And I think one of the ways to do that is what we're doing today. Headphones on, nice microphones that enhance our voice and recording it. So we have it for posterity and we can pass it on to someone else and we can help other people learn. To me, that organizes it and it formalizes it. It makes it something that's a heightened version of reality. A lot of podcast hosts say, I want it to feel like we're just having a conversation. I get that, but I take it a different way. I like regular conversations to feel more like podcasts. I really do. I think there's something that happens when you get in this podcast space that just raises the stakes ever so slightly. It kind of makes it more formal. Now, you know, I don't mean black tie, but I mean, we're responsible for our choices and we want to put a good message together. Yeah. Being defined, I think, and also thinking about your words, because the conversation, if, if you're not aware of this, you're doing it, which is when there's a microphone in the room that changes the energy of the room. When you know you're being taped, even if that tape doesn't go out anywhere, the fact that it could. Definitely. And certainly it changes it. You might have been able to hear it when I hit record on this. Like, hey, it's David here. You know, <laughs> sometimes your inflection is going to change a little bit. I think that's huge, right? Because some people, they'll say, I want the lavalier mic, not to get too technical, but the one that clips on your, your shirt. Right. Because guests will say, well, you know, they forget they're being recorded. It's not my style. My style is I like this microphone that has a little bit of um, stakes to it. Like it's this arm looking at me and. I'm focused and I'm nowhere else but here. And I really, I like that. Maybe that's the athlete in me. Maybe that's uh, just my style, but I love that. The other thing I think can be really helpful is to have a focus. You talked to me uh, prior to our conversation about like, a lot of what we'll talk about is mentorship and learning and lifelong learning. I'm happy to talk about anything you want, but I know when you focus it, it has a value that that exceeds just kind of being laissez-faire. So when you meet with a mentor, and at least when I do, I'll be honest with you, I went into my most formal uh, reverse mentorship situation, and I actually had a question. I said, you know, listen, I want to I'm gonna let you know, I'm going to bring a yellow legal pad in, and I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more formal, but I don't want you to think I'm being stuffy. I'm not evaluating anything you're saying. I just like, I want to take this seriously. She okay. said, fine. And I said, all right, here's my first question. It's a softball. What do you know to be true about how readers and writers learn best? Like, we're not starting with a softball. Like, we're not like, how's the weather? Like, I want to get to your core philosophy <laughs> right. in one question, yeah. because I've been doing this for 23 years, and I bet that even though you've only been doing it for two, you have something really important to say. So that focus and that urgency and that, what I would might call a high velocity question, I, it just works for me, and I think it sets the tone. Well, does that intimidate people, though? It can. I was working next to an agency, like a model actor agency office right next to them. And it was weird because they would always have like casting calls or something like that. And they would put two people on the couch and they would have to have rapport. And what got really weird, it goes, okay, make out. It's a love scene, <laughs> you know? And you had to act like you knew somebody instantly when they, maybe they met in line or something. I don't know. I think of that when I think about what you and I do. And I just go in acting like the rapport is there. Like, hey, you know, what's going on? I'm, I'm a little familiar with your work. You were a little familiar with mine. So that might have made it easier. But I do wonder if people are able to get into that as quickly as we would out of having so much practice. Red light syndrome, we call it. When you hit that red light, even somebody who is loose, when that red light goes on, uh, 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 you know, they're not as loose. That's a great observation. And, um, it's one that I, I, I work with clients on when I work one-on-one -on -one to have the best conversations of your life without feeling like you're interrogating someone, trying to get into the nooks and crannies of that art and science convergence where it's like, hey, I want to ask a question now, but I want it to be a really good question, but I don't want to put too much pressure on myself or the other person. 
And I think there's a lot of human behaviors that have to come into play. Something as simple as a smile, right? So the voice and the throat change shape when you're smiling. You know, listeners can usually tell when like you're actually smiling and you're talking. Because if I just change my voice and I, I don't even try to change my voice, I just stop smiling. There's a big difference. So right there, you can tell like when I'm excited just by that. I can't because this is audio only. So we're going to revisit that in a second. Finish your thought. And we're going to talk about audio versus video because I'd love to know your thought about that. See, I bet if a listener rewinds the tape 15, 30 seconds, I bet they'll be able to tell that I was smiling without seeing this gorgeous face. That's my hunch. <laughs> I think the vo I've heard this and I believe this to be true. The vocal cords themselves change shape just ever so slightly when you're smiling. And so that's like a human patina effect where you literally are making the question softer by your tone. I think the other thing that you do is you compliment your partner or the host or the guest when you ask a question that's specific. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. If you say on air, and there's nothing wrong with it, but if you say on air, how did you uh, decide to name your company? It's a fine question, nothing wrong with it. But if you were able to find it out ahead of time, and then the next question you ask would be the first question, and you could say, I noticed you named your company X. What was the most popular objection to that when you did whatever it would be you're getting a level deeper and although i don't mind small talk sometimes i like to find out how can i get to a deeper level of rapport and connection quicker just simply by virtue david of the fact that we have limited time on this earth right so i don't want to be callous but i do want to be urgent and have high velocity well people are hungry for that rapport and they're dying for it you've seen those people at maybe a meetup or a convention, they're dying to talk to you because they're so nervous about talking to other people and they want that connection with you and whatever. But I, I think getting to it is weird. Let's take it to that audio video thing because one of the reasons I do audio only is that I find video to be distracting. I think people are playing to the camera. It gives them something else to worry about. Like, hey, I got a pimple or my hair's whatever, receding or gray or sticking up or whatever. They're worried about a lot of other things. But when you can just hear the voice, it drops out everything else and you can really focus on the conversation. That's my theory because I want people to be comfortable. But I'm curious about with you, uh, you mentioned obviously smiling and non-visual cues. That stuff can help in an in-person conversation. And we certainly have those things when doing in-person conversations. But with you doing these remote interviews, talk about your process of developing this rapport. I know you mentioned that you'd use Squadcast in the past. Are you doing video and audio? Well, it's interesting, right? So let's let's take this as, as kind of a nerdy moment that will actually help people. If I was going to rank the, the three possibilities, and there may be more, but if we were to go uh, audio only, virtual, which we're doing now, or in person, on a stage, or somewhere where it's pretty intimate, or video and audio uh, virtually, I would go in person as far and away the best opportunity for all the tools of communication. Second would be audio only. And then third, to your point, would be the video, which is super distracting. I had a, a high profile guest on recently and he or she was looking down uh, the whole time. Now, that's pretty normal because you're looking to see how you look. But the reality is if this person was looking up, we would have made eye contact. So right then and there, if I have to worry about that, if she has to worry about that, if he has to worry about that, we've already taken something off the table. And that's why this audio only format is, I mean, listen, if it's good enough for Terry Gross, it's good enough for you and me, <laughs> right. right? It locks you in. It locks you in in the best possible way. You know, be where your feet are. Well, where am I going to be? I mean, I, I don't have to worry if my collar's just straight. I can lock in and give you my undivided attention. I love it. Now, every marketing guru I know says, why aren't you releasing YouTube videos? Yeah, well, you yeah, know, but, you know, when we could talk about that another time, but like, yeah. I think the quality of the conversation improves when it's audio only. The level of intimacy of just listening, I, I think people are more comfortable just in general. Like they can get in a dark room. They can, it's like being a, a, a in a shrink's office, lying back, telling your story. But it is interesting. I, I will say this. This is a side note that I hadn't thought about till you just said it. I used to do in-person interviews every week for the broadcast show that I do. And that's great, but I'm taking notes. I'm figuring out where the next segment's going to go because we are timed. We've got four 13-minute sections. I've got to come in and out of breaks. And what I found myself doing was writing 
notes while the person is talking. So I've had to let people know, hey, listen, you're going to see me writing just like you did with your mentor. Don't pay attention to me. You just keep talking. And I am listening, but I'm also writing and trying to figure this out. I found that to be very helpful because people thought I was ignoring them. Mm. And I I was so caught up in my head. So you've got to have your own awareness. And I, I think you don't have to have awareness of yourself like that with just audio. You're right. And I think that that method benefits from a pro guest. And by a pro, I mean a seasoned media person, because they know that there's a degree of showmanship. We want to be authentic. We want to be valuable. We want to be present. But there is a degree of, of showmanship if a musical artist is on. So they're seeing you right, okay, and they're still able to kind of be on 100%, even though it would be pretty distracting. I don't take any notes at all when I'm interviewing someone, even if I'm looking at them through a virtual screen. So my most common form of recording for the last 100 episodes has been we'll show the video, but we'll only record audio, which I think has the same effect, right? Because it puts people at ease. It's the equivalent of saying, don't worry about what you look like. And actually, sometimes when I when I woo a guest, I'll put in there, no dress up. Hey, no dress up required. Yeah, We're just <laughs> going to be honest. So I think it has the same effect. Um, and I think it's a style preference. But don't forget that 13 minute format you're doing. That's a different level. That's a different animal. And, and you need sometimes to do everything at your disposal to make that efficient. Yeah, it is a different thing because we have timing and I've got to cut people off and hey, all right, you know, and we got editing because it's not live. Sometimes it's live if we're doing like a live event or something like that. But yeah, it it definitely gives you those, uh, gives you more options and sometimes less options. But hey, speaking of showbiz, I do want to talk about vulnerability and attempting new things. One of the things you did on your podcast, which I thought was interesting, you took singing (laughs) lessons. Oh boy. (laughs) I'm a musician as well, was a musician but had a degree in music, played for a number of years, and then transitioned into the music business. So I thought this was an interesting thing. Singing is very hard for somebody to do in front of other people. And uh, it's that vulnerability. And there's a lot that can go wrong when you're singing, more than speech, arguably, because you have to have rhythm and you've got to have pitch. But you did it. And I want to talk about that because I think there's some interesting parallels to podcasting that people can learn from singers. And I'm curious if you took some of those things away. Talk about the experiment, though, first of all, because I think this was really interesting. Episode 220, I titled it The One Where Joey Sings. A little playoff friends there. I don't know if they'll become calling for a lawsuit, but (laughs) I just for many years have thought that, you know, I've never had any musical training whatsoever. And sometimes people are kind and they'll compliment my speaking voice and I'll deflect and say some of it's the microphone and some of it's just enjoying communication and trying different things and a lot of reps, but with no musical training whatsoever in my entire life, which is another problem for another day. And maybe we'll go to that shrinks couch, as you said, um, I just felt like in the spirit of learning, kind of lighting up different parts of my brain, what would happen if I hired a speaking coach to see if I can go from zero to one or like how long it would take? And I've had a a number of lessons and I've recorded a couple of things privately where like, all right, here was after lesson one, here's after lesson two, here's after lesson three. Now, David, honestly, I'm going to have to get uh, responsible at some point and decide how much money to invest because I I don't know it's reasonable to continue to um, pay someone for something that I don't have any real major aspirations for, probably use that funding somewhere else. But what I'm getting out of it in the short term, and of course, some content doesn't hurt, but, but the real purpose is how far can I push myself out of my comfort zone? Right. How vulnerable can I be for my listeners? I've probably gotten more emails on that episode than, than any recent episode of Time of Air because people are saying, wow, I can't believe you were willing to do that. You know what's funny? Not one person said you were really terrible, which objectively would have been true, right? Like you could easily, especially with your background, you could easily find a pitch or key or any of those words. I don't know what they mean. And say you were off of it. You weren't in. <laughs> well, in. yeah, but look, if, if you go on American Idol and Simon is going to say, oh, it's a bit pitchy. It's a bit, you know, it's, you hear that from even professional singers. We're so used to auto tune and a perfectly tuned, manufactured vocal. People don't even know what real singing sounds like. So I, I would say, yes, you can find problems with your singing problems, but there's also a human element to them as well. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, so you're, you're correct, but it's also, there's something obviously that you connected with people through what you did. And that's what podcasting or singing is about to me. I appreciate that. And I, and I had a conversation with uh, my cousin who uh, was in an acapella group 
and, and she was just tickled by the experiment and, and, you know, was giving me all kinds of feedback. And now I'm thinking, I don't want to scam her out of free lessons, but if she's, if she's willing, <laughs> maybe, maybe she comes on after a few of these and I pay someone an honest day's wage in the past and then we move on to the cousin, but I don't know. Well, I've got something for you to ask her. I was going to mention this uh, also an acapella group, kind of, I, I know a guy named Claude McKnight. Yeah. He's with a band called Take Six. His brother, Brian McKnight, famous R&B artist. Wow. And one of the interesting things that Claude and, and Brian can do is not only are they just amazing singers, but they can also imitate other singers. So if you say, hey, Brian, sound like Michael Jackson, he can do it. I mean, exactly. It's amazing. And I asked Claude, I said, what's the secret to being a great vocalist? Because you can imagine this. Take six, as the name would imply, six singers. It's a cappella. If you ever saw the show Marvin, yeah. Marvin Lawrence, they did the theme song from it. Fly to the oh. Bumblebee. That's the kind of vocal gymnastics they're doing. And he told me this. He said, good singers are good listeners. And what he means by that is if you want to be on pitch and you want to do your thing, you've got to listen to the other singers around you. You've got to listen to the music or the band around you. And I thought, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting because that's also what you and I do, Joe, is a good interviewer. It's not just us talking, good hosts. You're listening to the people that you're communicating with. And that enables you to respond and adjust if needed. That's so interesting because I don't have any musical talents yet. We'll use that word. But I, if I had to, like if you said to me, you have to do something, I actually feel like I could imitate a number of singers, which both conveys your point and like gets in the way of ever discovering. If I were to keep with that, it would, it would get in the way of me ever discovering my original and unique voice. So if you said like do a little Frank Sinatra or do a little bit of, you know, the national or whatever it would be, I could do it a little bit, but what a deep layered lesson there, right? Like I'll never find my original voice if I do that. However, it complements what I hope is a, is an emerged and polished skill set that I work on daily, which is listening. So I love kind of chewing on that dichotomy there. Well, let me throw another songwriter trick out to you. And this might show you that you actually are discovering your voice. One of the tricks that Upcoming songwriters, even pro songwriters use, if they've got writer's block, let's say you take Let It Be by the Beatles. All right, I want you to rewrite Let It Be, and I want you to take whatever the imagery, the motif, let it be, just let it go, whatever. Mm -hmm. Do your version of it, rewrite it. It's not going to become exactly the same thing, and in that, you find your own voice. Wow. So I would argue by imitating other people, you find what works for you and what doesn't. You might have experienced that with your podcast, in that... Your podcast isn't completely an original creation. You're doing some of the same stuff that I would do or any other podcaster would do. We all do, but you've made it your own. And that comes with jumping in and finding, I like more of this, less of this, more salt, less pepper, whatever. That's fantastic. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I do see that. It's interesting you mentioned that because that's not something I've ever thought about, but I know a lot of people, like I don't listen to anything because I want to do my own stuff. Interesting. And I would say, how do you tune your guitar? I say E-A-D-G-B-E. Uh, you're copying people then, so stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing you mentioned too that I thought was interesting, breathing. I'm struggling, struggling with the breath, David. How do you think that your podcast, you're breathing when you're talking though, right? Have you seen any parallels with that? It's funny uh, you asked that because um, in the, I don't know when it started, but very much in the beginning, I guess, in somewhere in the departure from the original baseball podcast to this one, I just decided that I was going to do some like heightened form of like, hello and welcome to 1% better episode 300 is here. like this whole thing. And then immediately I come in and I'm like, well, I thank you so much for being here. It's episode 300. <laughs> right. David Hooper is our guest. And it's like, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing there. I'm just having fun and there's breath, but I always find myself out of breath on the hello and welcome which I think has the most parallels to like the songs I'm trying to sing where like my instructor said, let your, your vocals sit on top of the air. And that was like a transformative idea. And then my cousin said, you know, just drop in on top of the note. And I'm like, I, I literally have no idea what you're talking about. And we've worked through that and I, I kind of get what she's saying. <laughs> right. Now. Right. You could start to hear stuff that you wouldn't have heard otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, and it's really amazing. I know when, like when you paint your house, the next day, like the back of your shoulder is sore and you're like, I didn't even know I had a muscle there. Right. <laughs> That's how my brain feels when I'm singing. Like, yeah. Or, you know, and one, the one, one or two times I played guitar, you know, just like, oh, just saying the chord out loud and like, you're just activating things that you didn't even know were there. Something I've noticed, I'm recording an audio book right now and 
I'm used to speaking, obviously. I'm on a podcast all the time. You can ask my wife. I speak a lot. But recording the audiobook, it puts me in a different mindset because I'm reading and I want to have that perfect read. And I find my voice getting more tired and I can't do it. I can maybe do, let's say, an hour or two, which is a lot of people would say, oh, that's a long time to have that kind of level of focus. But I've had to work up to that. And what I realize is that that is me putting too much energy, you know, not letting the voice sit on top of the breath, as you will. Mm. The other stuff I'm a lot more laid back on. And I know this from working in rock and roll for so many years that you will see a lot of guys blow out their voice and you'll see other singers that are absolutely amazing. They've been doing it 40, 50 years. Go talk to Lionel Richie. Still sounds amazing. Now, granted, he's doing a, an easy type of music, uh, Claude that I mentioned. It's amazing doing it for 40, 50 years. And it's because those guys have that ease. I think as podcasters, we develop that ease. So I, I would imagine you went into these singing lessons with a lot more of that musical background than you realized, even though we're not calling it music because you're listening and you're, you're breathing. I mean, yeah, that's, on, on some level, on some level. I think, I think you're right. And I think that that's astute of you to point out. And I've been lucky enough to interview a few people whose specialties are listening. So I think I pick up skills here and there and, uh, it's weird. Now, now you have me thinking about singing later today. You got to, man. Yeah, keep it up. Let's put you on the spot. What song should I should I seek out to, to sing on my way home? Over the Rainbow. Really? Yeah. Are you saying that for comedy or no? <laughs> no. No. You because, think I can get there? Well, I think it has it has a nice it has uh uh like the bridge in it, the the chorus. Dun, 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 dun. But then it get you know, it goes way up high. Why can't I? I mean, it's okay. uh, it gives you something to strive for, just uh, notes, and it gives you okay. different range and things. So I, I would say that would be a kind of a fun vocal exercise. It's easy to find a copy of it, and you probably know it more than you realize. That will happen on the way home. I will report back. <laughs> but that's my philosophy. Like, jokes aside, like, right there, I didn't even mean to do this. Right there is, like, what I would say. I hope separates me from other people. Like, I'm not kidding when I say, like, I'm going to sing that on the way home, right? Like, I'm not, like, just saying that for a showbiz. Yeah, you got to practice. My mind is like, I want to ask a weird question to you on the spot because I felt it. What song should I pick? And you have a musical background. Now I put it in there. I would never have expected it. I listened to it on the way home. I say, like, I just love stuff like that. I mean, obviously, the name of the show is all about the ethos of getting a little bit better. But guess what? I have to live it. And I don't know which one comes first, but I love it both. Final question for you, speaking of getting a little bit better, you've got this, I guess we'll call it a philosophy of learning in public. What's an advantage of learning in public? And then talk about the advantage of keeping it to yourself or are there advantages of, I mean, why, why in public, I guess is the question. Such a cool worded question because I'm thinking about both polarities, right? So it's like the singing piece, there's a bit of a, a ham element, right? We're on the mic and we're bringing an audience um, with us and there's like that adrenaline but there is also a degree of service there that would be the first thing that comes to my mind is when you learn or build in public people often forget or mistake david the service aspect of it i'm not a hero i'm not asking for a reward in any way but think about it if i can have a guest on the show and we've offered value to someone that's in public while we're learning and it passes on. So there's an exponential piece to that. There's something I admire though about the private learning as well. And I think we both do a lot of that, right? Who are we studying in our off time? We're not doing it all, you know, the singing in the shower, all the things that, you know, you can get to a place where you kind of go away, you cobble together some resources, you put your head down, you get some work together and then you kind of emerge as a new person. You've been transformed in some ways, big or small, because you did that private study. It doesn't have to be showy. So I think those are some of the um, initial hallmarks of the differences that I see. I don't think we could ignore the F word, which is fun. I think building and learning in public is fun. Well, you can have a community around you, which I think is super helpful to know that you're not the only one that's going through that. That community piece is huge. A leader that I know very well in my life uh, about a year ago said, well, you're a community guy. Am I? And he's like, we have a podcast where, you know, thousands of listeners reach out and listen and say kind things and challenge you. You know, you're a classroom teacher. And I'm like, this is, you, you do reunions with students that come back. I'm like, whoa, I never really embraced it vocally. But you're exactly right. 
Yeah, good thoughts, man. I, I don't know about the whole learning in public because there's a part of me takes it back because you call it the showbiz thing that it's sometimes nice to give people something to aspire to, like a perfectly written song or a great show. But at the same time, it's not really the full story. My wife is a photographer and everything she puts out is photoshopped and <laughs> it takes hours of work, one photograph. Wow. And people think that it's just like, oh, just click the shutter and somebody's that beautiful and the makeup was already there. And no, it is not. Wow. I mean, it's like, uh, so I think in, in some ways that's a public service as well to show people that somebody like you, Joe, that is a confident speaker, smooth on the mic is how I would describe it. Good listener. It didn't just happen. At the same time, if we do put it in public, it, it's like you talk call 1% better. Uh, I think it's Kaizen is the word. Yep. From Japan, that you it's it. a small incremental progress and it's so slow. Sometimes we don't see it in ourselves and even watching others, we're not going to see it. It's what we're all trying to do. And I think the bottom line is you got to show up and you've been doing it. So you're a couple hundred episodes in plus some and it's available at damngoodconversations.com. No plans on slowing it down or anything like that? Oh, God, no, 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 no. I, you know, the cohort work that I've been doing has been a combination of every skill in the bag. I thought when I started these cohort communities where it's a small group of up to a dozen people uh, that I get to lead, David, I thought I was like the trainer. Like I thought, oh, you know, they're here because Joe wants to teach them how to ask better questions or to learn from mistakes. And a lot of what it was, was facilitating. Yeah. Unleashing and uncovering the very best of who these people want to be. I mean, one gentleman launched a podcast that's like the quirkiest, coolest idea that I can say with utter certainty, he would have never had the courage, skills, or, or any type of confidence to launch. And when you see that and it goes into the world, it's generative for everybody in the group. Now I'm inspired to be more and now I can take a step back. And one of my favorite parts of the cohort is like connecting. I'm like, oh, David, you don't need to talk to the whole group on this issue. I'm going to connect you with Chris. Chris is the guy that can solve your problems. And just that piece of connection, that community, right? All the C words, communication, curiosity, they all go together and uh, it's beautiful. So no, absolutely no slowing down. It's good to have that inspiration, man, because uh, as I approach 50 here, sometimes I think, man, am I going to be able to do this for another 20, 30 years? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've done it so far. There's always an element in me though that thinks, did you just get lucky? <laughs> no, I won't accept that. I, I mean, I'm a fan of your work. I uh, I loved listening to, you know, one of my favorite things preparing for this conversation was just listening to you on the mic and, and have different guests on and um, just to be able to learn from you and then be prepared to really step into the space with you today. So no, no yeah, luck. Man. And you did. You did. So Joe Ferraro, damngoodconversations.com to, to get more information about the podcast. Definitely do that. The cohort, all the other stuff he's got going on. Joe, thanks for being here. It's been fun. It's been an absolute blast, David. Thank you for the invitation. Joe Ferrero on Build a Big Podcast. If you really want to see this stuff in action, go check him out. The podcast, 1percentbetterproject.com. It's got a lot of good stuff on there. Hundreds of episodes. He's been doing it for a minute. You're going to get something out of him when it comes to making yourself better. And you want to do this. Most people, speaking of hundreds of episodes, it's not really hundreds of episodes. It's one episode, hundreds of times. One of the great things about your podcast is you're showing up every day. You've got a new guest. You've got new things to talk about. You can do it a little bit differently, get yourself a little bit better, and you've got everything on tape. So you can go back, and the incremental change that you can't see, you can't hear in this case, go back 10 episodes, 20 episodes, 100 episodes, you will hear the difference and see and hear how much better you're getting. Check Joe out, 1percentbetterproject.com. It really is a great podcast. For more from this podcast, you know, I've got multiple episodes too. Here's how to get them. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Go there. I've got three ways for you to subscribe. iPhone link, Android link, RSS link. One click is all it takes to get you subscribed instantly, regardless of how you are listening to your podcast. And if you want to get fancy, go on your desktop. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. I've got a QR code there. Pull your phone out. Boom. Instantly on your phone, you will see a subscribe link. It's going to get you hooked up however you are listening to your podcast. That way, when you go in your car, you want to listen to me on the car stereo? Hey, man, I sound great on the car stereo. Don't take my word for it. Go there. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Put it on your phone. Listen on your car stereo. You'll see. In the gym, there's nothing more motivating to that Stairmaster workout than hearing me talk in your ear about podcasting. <laughs> 
<laughs> Find out if it's true, bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Thank you for listening. I'll see you on the next episode of Build a Big Podcast.